Good evening uh, and welcome everyone. My name is Noah Rauch. I'm the Senior Vice President for Education and Public Programs here at the 9-11 Memorial and Museum. It is my pleasure to welcome you all to tonight's program, the very first of our fall season. I want to extend a special welcome to our museum members and to those tuning in live um, on our web broadcast. Uh, we mark the 22nd anniversary uh, of 9-11 on Monday. And tonight we mark another attack carried out by Al Qaeda three years beforehand. On August 7th, 1998, truck bombs exploded at US embassies in Nairobi, Kenya and Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, killing 224 people and injuring more than 4,000. In response to the attacks, over 900 FBI agents and many more FBI employees traveled overseas to assist in the recovery of evidence, the identification of victims, and to track down the perpetrators. The FBI's investigation of the attacks, codenamed Kenbaum and Tanbaum, were at the time the largest deployment in the Bureau's history. To commemorate the 25th anniversary of the bombings, we're joined this evening by Mary Galligan and John Liguri, both former members of the FBI, who were instrumental in those investigations. Retired Special Agent in Charge Mary Galligan responded on the ground to the bombing in Dar es Salaam. She joined the FBI in 1988 and spent 25 years in counterterrorism and cyber investigations. She held numerous leadership positions within the Bureau during her distinguished tenure, including serving as an on-scene commander of the investigation of the USS Cole attack uh, in Yemen and leading PENTBOM, the FBI's investigation into 9-11. In July 2010, Mary was named the first female special agent in charge for the New York's office's uh, Cyber and Special Operations Division. She retired from the Bureau in May 2013 and now works at a large consulting firm as Managing Director of Cyber Risk Services. She, I have to say, is a longtime friend of this institution and we are incredibly grateful for her continued generosity and the time which she's given us um, over many, many years. Retired FBI Supervisory Special Agent John Liguri was supervisor of the FBI squad that oversaw the trial of perpetrators connected to the attack. John worked 31 years with the Bureau, 20 of which were spent on the New York Joint Terrorism Task Force. He is the recipient of numerous com commendations, including two United States Attorney General Awards for excellence in investigation and leadership. After leaving, leaving the FBI, John joined the Forensic and Integrity Services team at Ernst & Young. He currently works as an independent consultant conducting forensic accounting audits and compliance reviews. We were gonna be joined this evening virtually from Kenya by Natasha Mbugus, who's a general manager of the August 7th Memorial Park. Unfortunately, because of technical issues, she's not able to join us, but she will be um, offering her story um, and her remarks and her insights via different platforms, so please keep an eye out for that. So I wanna thank you all for joining us. I wanna thank our speakers, and I'll turn it over uh, to Cliff Shannon, Museum Director. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, and welcome everybody. Um, Mary, I think you've been on the stage as much as I have over the oh, years. I don't know about just, that, Cliff. It's really, I mean, it's quite remarkable. So it's thank nice you again, to be and John. Here, yeah. uh, My welcome, pleasure. Welcome aboard. Thanks for having me. Um, you know, I, thinking back about um, this attack, 25 years, which is, of course, a, pre a precursor to what would come later. But I went back and read a lot of the reporting at the time. And it does not immediately focus on Al Qaeda. Al-Qaeda is somewhere out there, but it's only one of a number of different possibilities. And at that point in time, at least in the public imagination, it's not even the most dangerous of those possibilities. And so you all are already at the Bureau. You are already involved in issues related to Al-Qaeda and those who have affiliations in one way or another with it. So if you would, please frame for us where the Bureau was at that point. We know bin Laden is out there. There's been the 1993 bombing, just not a bin Laden operation, but it's a sympathetic operation in the sense of a shared ideology. Bin Laden declares war on the United States in 1996 and again in 1998, and in that 98 declaration justifies the killing of civilians. So there's, there's a lot out there, but it's not really the focal point of at least the public imagining of what's going on. So let me start with John and give us a little bit about, as you were working these issues, what was it that you were focused on and what popped that would later be relevant in relation to these two bombings sure. in August 1998? Sure, it's, it's, it's just interesting how the work you do sometimes here 
how a homicide in Brooklyn basically wound up having a lot of relevance to the embassy bombings in Kenya and took us out to Kenya. Uh, in the late 1980s, um, I was working with a group of uh, a few other individuals on some of the radical elements of, of some of the African Islamic movements here in New York City. Individuals were involved with robbing banks and feeding the coffers of certain imams uh, that were much more criminal in nature than any religious uh, context. And we were doing quite a bit of investigation with respect to that, developing sources. Uh, in the early 1990s, we developed a source that continued to take us into these individuals, but then they also had some meetings with some members from some groups that we were also familiar with. Uh, there was an individual, the Blind Sheikh, who was an Egyptian cleric uh, that was now in the New York City, New Jersey area and living. And he headed up an organization called al Qamad al-Islamaya. And they were offshoots of that known as the Egyptian Islamic Jihad. We had a source taking us into meetings between these individuals. And in the early 1990s, actually 1991, there was a homicide in Seagate, uh, which is right inside of Coney Island, at the peninsula of Coney Island. And an individual by the name of Mustafa Shalabi was killed. Mustafa Shalabi was heading up at that time the al Kifa Refugee Center, which was overtly posted as a fundraising aid type organization. But that was the entity that was basically raising money for jihad, uh, back in the 70s, going back to the 70s, the jihad that took place in Afghanistan with Russia, but even some more current things that would take place even over in Croatia and other parts of the world. There was a falling out and Shalabi was murdered. We took a look into the murder and we went out to the precinct and in the NYPD Redwell for the homicide was a little notebook and in that notebook was the name Wadi al Hajj. And there was also a copy with a picture of a, of a photo from Texas. We started doing some leads with that there, trying to identify where he was and track him down. Uh, not that we believed him to be involved in the homicide itself. We, we don't believe that even to this day. Uh, we put it on some other individuals. But um, what happens is, fast forward a few years to 1996, um, the FBI is, joins up with the CIA and a group is called Alex Station, which many of you may have heard of in early 1996. I was asked to go down in the first stages of the Alex Station, have an accounting background to go down and take a look at some of the records there. And going through the CIA files, I saw the name Wadi al Hajj. And that was one of the things that was basically the impetus for putting together the opening of the Al Qaeda investigation in the New York field office. Uh, turns out Wadi al, Wadi al Hajj is a very relevant player. Uh, he was a fundraiser or a supporter. He handled NGOs over non-governmental organizations over in Kenya. And he comes up immediately in the wake of the bombings of the embassy. Mary, you are in the New York office at this point. You are working related issues. Yes. How dangerous did you think things were? I mean, when the bombings happen, Simultaneously, and again, the reporting at that time is surprised by how well coordinated these two attacks are. Were you expecting this? Did it surprise you, the capacities that were demonstrated through these attacks? Were you somehow looking for something that was going to be that big? Where was the FBI focus, at least as you experienced it at that point in time? Well, to build off of what John said, Cliff, I mean, the FBI New York office knew a lot more about Al Qaeda and Osama bin Laden than, as you said earlier, than the public did. And, then, and more than most other um, law enforcement agencies. And so in 1996, 98, the Al-Qaeda squad starts. 96. 96. And you, know, you have people like Dan Coleman and Frank Pellegrino and John working that. I, I think that when you ask me how I felt is that I was a believer, as a lot of people were at that time, that these were attacks were overseas, um, but the in, but the uh, newness of attacking U.S. targets, like blatant. I mean, of course, you've had um, targets hit before in Beirut with the Marine barracks, but hitting two embassies was so symbolic, um, and that the majority of people killed were the foreign nationals of both of those countries. Um, so I. To us in the, you know, can't speak for everybody in the FBI, but it was a message. And the message was, you're the United States, and wherever you are in the globe, Al-Qaeda has this fatwa against you. So what's the reaction, and ask for each of you, the word comes in about the bombings. 
Is this immediately something that the New York office is going to be involved in? I mean, how, what happens? What's your reaction when you hear this? Does it make sense? Does it open up a whole new horizon for you? Do you think you're going to be involved in one way or another? I'll start with John. What, what's the reaction yeah, to the uh, bombings? Un unfortunately, it didn't open up a horizon as far as a shock uh, that they could pull off something like this here. Uh, the New York office became involved at the time. The squad, the Al-Qaeda squad, was headed up by his supervisor, Tom Lang, a number of agents like uh, Mary mentioned uh, Dan Coleman and Mike Antisef had a lot of historical information and a number of people, quite a number of people, the whole squad were dedicated to already doing some work on bin Laden's. So what happens when this does happen, uh, that's how New York wound up being the primary office handling that investigation. Many times in the FBI, extraterritorial, ter extraterritorial investigations were handled out of Washington, D.C. In this particular case, the focus immediately went on Al Qaeda and New York and the Southern District for prosecutorial purposes wound up being the focus of the investigation and large groups of agents, I never made my way over to Tanzania or Kenya, but uh, large waves of agents wound up going over there and conducting investigations. And I'll let Mary give you some insight with that. How Sorry. does that happen, Mary, that you get assigned to you know, go over there? I mean, they're putting large numbers of people together, I assume. Right. Um, I always like to say, Cliff, that you defend democracy in the FBI, you don't practice it. So. <laughs> You can laugh, it's okay. Um, so when they say you're going to Tanzania or you're going to Kenya, you're going. But um, the way that I think the key thing is it some, builds off of something that you said. To the FBI and to the New York office, it was Al Qaeda. And you are correct that other, even intelligence agencies, there was discussion around that, right? Mm -hmm. It wasn't a clear black and white. So the first thing that was a concern about the agents going at all is, of course, now you have two countries that have to invite the US in from an investig investigation perspective. But they did because we had technology and we had expertise that they did not have. At the time that I went to Tanzania, it was the fourth poorest country in the world. So you have something like that happening in the environment of Tanzania, and you have this US resources. But there was a concern of, as John mentioned, they were so organized, would they attack the team that came to investigate? That was, I, I will say, more of a passing thought. But when the USS Cole happens, it becomes almost um, uh, it, it became an absolute. They were going to attack the team and, and how do you keep them safe? So in the embassy bombings, the first thing that, that w was done from the logistical or tactical point is sending a small footprint at first, um, working with those two governments of, can we bring automatic weapons? Um, can we bring SWAT team to protect us? Is the military going to protect us? Um, in Tanzania, where I was, um, we were at a hotel in Dar es Salaam that was on the water, um, and therefore we could protect three sides of it um, using FBI SWAT agents and, and, and military personnel. Because when you do go over to these um, uh, terrorist incidents around the world, you're going as a unit with the CIA, with the NSA, um, at times with uh, the uh, military intelligence, um, and you pretty much usually don't know how long you'll be there for. Um, and you go and you land and it's, okay, how do I set up a command center, so to speak? Um, and then I, I'm, in a little while we can talk about the actual investigation and, and what the agents were doing. So let me just set the scene a little bit. The, mm -hmm. the vast majority of the casualties occur in Nairobi because the embassy at that point is essentially in the center of the city. Correct. The embassy in Dar es Salaam is in a residential neighborhood essentially. And as I read the story of how it happened, there's a truck blocking the access to the embassy, so the truck bomb doesn't really do the same kind of damage, and there weren't as many people around. In Nairobi, there are, uh, the, an adjoining building essentially collapses. And so the guards, the Kenyan guards at the door, did a re at the gate, did a remarkable job keeping the truck from coming in, because that was their original intention. But, can you describe the scene and the shock within the government? You may not have been immediately in Kenya, you were in Tanzania, but you probably know both stories. Mm -hmm. What were they reacting like to this? And did that increase the, po the possibilities of cooperation or did that create barriers to cooperation? Um, they were so grateful that we were there. 
Um, I expected, and you know, I knew the agents who were in Nairobi because you're talking to them all day long. Um, and we both groups expected that there would be such anger towards us, right? Because we're American and these uh, foreign nationals would not have died if it wasn't for the American target. They were very, very grateful that we were there because the United States had the resources also to help with the putting the investigation aside, but the recovery, mm -hmm. to help with the um, uh, coming back with an infrastructure that was needed around both of the embassies. The embassy in Dar es Salaam, as you said, was more a residential area. But what struck me going there was, you know, there's always something that is an everyday thing and you don't think about it until you see it. But there were all these bicycles lined up because many people in both countries would go to work on their bicycle. And they were, um, you know, burnt and melted together and, um, you know, charred and destroyed. And they were there. They were still there, even though we, we weren't there the day of the bombing. And it just struck me that people, everyday people, went to work. Um, and these attacks happened because of bin Laden and his fatwa. Um, and also, as you mentioned, a number of the casualties were caused by running to the windows. Right, so in, in Dar es Salaam, I believe it was, there was the commotion with the truck, um, and one of the guards tries to run towards the embassy. And there's a commotion, and people come to the windows, and when the bomb goes off, that mm. also leads to um, the more loss of life. I should add, sure. and just to break this down a little bit, so 224 people are killed in all in both attacks. The number of injured is in the four to 5,000 range. Um, most of those casualties are in Nairobi uh, because of the condition, the location of the embassy. Um, 11 people are killed in Tanzania. But the striking thing is I went through this, 12 Americans are killed. They're all killed in uh, Nairobi. Um, but the local staff, which is sort of the base of how embassies run around the world, 34 Kenyan staff are killed in Nairobi, and uh, 10 Tanzanian staff are killed in Dar es Salaam. So, you know, the, the willingness to attack the United States was also a willingness to incur as many local casualties as was necessary, and I put it in, quotes, in quotation marks, of course, but they were not going to stop regardless of who was passing by. Uh, Tanzania is one third Muslim population. Mm -hmm. uh, Kenya is 10 or so percent Muslim. So the proximity of Muslims to this was not relevant to the attackers. Um, John, you're watching this happening and I'm sure the New York office is extremely engaged in trying to pull pieces together. What's happening back home as you're getting reports from, from Nairobi and Dar es Salaam? What's happening back home is we're getting a lot of phone calls, a lot of reports in that have to be run down locally. A lot of threats all the time what follows an incident like that, even if, if it turns out not being a criminal related incident. Uh, what, what happens is phone calls come into operation centers all over the country about threats, sightings, additional bombings and things like that there. At the time I happened to be, I had become a supervisor and happened to have the squad that handled those threats. So it was actually an extremely busy time for that sometime after, I believe, right, of only within a few weeks later, I, I forget what aircraft it was, but an airline went down over Halifax in Canada. Immediately suspicion went to, was this a bombing on an airliner? Same type of reactive type of thing. So even here in New York City, though the event didn't happen here, running out tremendous amount of leads just in response. And of course, the squad that had been doing the proactive investigation looking into this group was some of them were getting deployed and many were getting deployed to other parts of the world where there was intelligence being picked up about potential cooperators or where cooperators that we already had were possibly stationed and they had to go out and speak to them. So it was, it was a very busy worldwide investigation and busy here in the United States. Let me ask, and I think this picks up on something you sure. said, Mary. Um, was the operating assumption from the beginning, for those of you who are inside of this, that it was Al-Qaeda, that that was the prime uh, suspect, if you will, in this case? Yeah, I, as I said, I think I said, from the New York perspective and the, and the JTTF, um, it was extreme, especially from when you, when you talked to a Dan Coleman, who was the first agent who was working Al-Qaeda, there was very strong feeling in the New York office 
that it was Al-Qaeda for lots of reasons. A lot of information we had working, as John said, you have Alex stations set up. You're getting information from um, the, uh, the CIA. And also, one part of the investigation that sometimes gets overlooked is we had the Southern District of New York. Um, if you're not familiar, in New York City, there's two federal districts, the Southern District of New York um, and the Eastern District of New York. But the Southern District of New York had, just as the Eastern District does, but brilliant prosecutors. Um, and very, they were very aggressive in being our partners in the investigation. Hmm. So when you asked earlier about, you know, did we believe it was Al-Qaeda? Yes, there was a, a sealed indictment in the Southern District of New York against bin Laden, which of course, since it was sealed, couldn't be talked about. Um, it was, that intelligence was shared. So yes, now, did that mean that everybody agreed with the New York office of the FBI? No, mm. um, but they eventually come to agree with the New York office of the FBI. Um, and <laughs> right, New York office of the FBI agents that are here. So, you know, there's, all, there's always this, um, I'm gonna use the word politics loosely, right? It's the sharing of information within the FBI and then sharing it outside. One of our best partners in this investigation were, was the UK. Um, I mean, mm -hmm. the Five Eyes always work together, but the UK was right there with us. And just a, as a human a, um, interest aspect, we lost our embassy in, um, in both places. But in Dar es Salaam, we were in the British embassy and then we went into like these mobile trailers but all of the other countries the germans the brits um they were our support they were they fed us they the germans made sure that we had beverages if we wanted them um but you know that working together was very significant because of this understanding of the more and more people were starting to understand what this threat was to the world. Mm -hmm. And then we would later see that in the UK, in Spain, you know, these, these threat, um, attacks by Al Qaeda. So how does the investigation evolve? You're on the ground. In some ways, it's a crime scene like any other, I imagine. But at the same time, the pressure of this, the scale of this, and even a greater scale in Nairobi, what are you looking for? And how do you piece it back so that folks like John back in New York who are sort of in the nerve center of all this, how does it work that then you can give material to your colleagues back in New York or elsewhere around the world that's going to be relevant to the investigation and developing it further? So I think the key, one of the key things was how much we already knew, right? Um, John's already mentioned, you know, people that we already knew and then would become significant in Nairobi. The second thing was that, um, there was, you know, you can call it a break in the case, you can call it luck, but the driver in Nairobi um, runs and makes a phone call. No, I'm sorry, not the driver. It was the passenger who ran and he, 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 got, he, was, he got scared. Mm -hmm. And so he didn't partake in the attack. Um, and he makes a phone call and he's looking for money in order to get back to where he came from. Um, when you look at the intelligence then that was coming in from the CIA and the NSA, that became a significant thing. The other thing that became significant were phone records, right? So what the agents on the ground are doing are trying to look for doing interviews first, but then also other agents are working on, you know, what is, what can we gather? Um, and in Nairobi and Dar es Salaam, there is no AT&T or Verizon. And so we're talking going through like papers of, of phone bills to try to identify what we could. And through that, the, what we called the, um, the towns where the bombs were actually made, or villages, they really were villages, were identified. And then something that struck all of us was the agents went out with photo spreads I'm sure everybody knows what a photo spread is if you watch Law and Order, right? It's, it's uh, six pictures of, um, now remember, this is 1997 uh, and eight, which is, there's no computers or anything. So there's six pictures of uh, in, individuals and we want the people in the village to identify the bombers. And the people kept saying, well, this is him, but his head is too small. And what we realized and as you spent more time in the village, they, most of them were not familiar with photographs. So, you know, you talk about doing an investigation and then you have to talk about agents having to think on their feet. Um, an agent got a Polaroid camera 
and went back and started taking pictures and giving it to people and saying, see, this is you in a photograph. Mm. Your head is small. Um, but that was significant because we needed those identifications that would later lead to, you know, the over 20 people that were identified as part of the attack. So it was um, a complex investigation, but there was not a lot of advanced techniques that we could use. So John, um, again, back looking into these other leads and thinking of threats, did your, I can only imagine in fact that your assessment of the threat, the scale of threat. Is what? I, I would say, I'm asking whether your assessment of the scale of the risk, the scale of the threat, goes up, I imagine, several notches because of what's happened in the, in the embassies. This is now, I imagine, a much more urgent investigation because of what's just happened and the capacities that they've demonstrated. Yeah, I, I mean, I think in honesty, we had a sense of urgency with the investigation even prior to the bombing. And, and I'm not just saying that. There, there was a core of individuals that had real recognition within, the, you know, in the FBI that had a recognition that this was a very serious threat because there were other things that were immediately linked prior to the bombing to Al-Qaeda. Uh, a very important source was developed right after Alex Station was established. An individual by the name of uh, Jamal Al-Fadl was taken into custody or walked into the embassy in Germany. Uh, at first he was dismissed. A couple of agents from New York went out and spoke with him and he really filled in pictures, individuals, groups, theories that a number of squads and different groups had collectively put them together and tied them into Al-Qaeda. Sealed indictments that we had of an individual turns out being a very important player in the Al-Qaeda group. So we had a, a sense of urgency that they were able to do this. There's acts in Somalia and in Yemen that predate Al-Qaeda. They blew up the World Trade Center, which, you know, un unfortunately we do have short memories, but they blew that up in 1993 and were bent on doing more there was an in investigation taking place in Southeast Asia. I think you had that presentation from Frank Pellegrino, um, where Ramzi Youssef, the individual involved with the World Trade Center bombing, was also involved with Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, which becomes a prominent, well-known name post 9-11. But he was very much on our radar in the mid-1990s and trying to get him extradited from various countries. And one of his associates was a brother-in-law of Osama bin Laden. So the network was there with even Southeast Asian groups, European groups, American groups. Um, and, and the sense of urgency was there as to not knowing what these individuals were capable of doing. So, you know, these are, um, and I'm thinking of, I've been to Kenya, I haven't been to Tanzania, but the pictures you see, I mean, these are, in one case, a bustling city center. In other words, this beautiful, uh, area and they are devastated. What what was what were the people in the area, the the Tanzanians who came across? What were they saying? What were they feeling about all this? Um, I found the people in Tanzania, and this will stick with me for the rest of my life. They were so kind. Whether it was the people who worked at the hotel, or if you were driving through the streets, of course the windows are opened, and you know people. You're obviously we're an American, and you're in a convoy, so. Um, you know, people were yelling things in that were all kind. Um, and that, I mean, we had people saying to us that they were sorry. And we were looking at them as, well, the reason this happened is because we're Amer the Americans are here. Um, but it was their culture. It was, um, it was how they were raised. And one of the things that, um, from, a, from how the people were, is at the very end in, when we were in Tanzania and we had to wrap up the evidence and put it on a plane and bring it back to the US for the trials. Um, at the hotel, the agents, and I was there, wanted to do something for all the people that worked there and wanted to um, you know, do like a barbecue. Because um, what happened is they would get paid once a month and they would buy meat and uh, uh, perishables have those, and then when they ran out for the rest of the month, they would do more fruits and, and grains. So we wanted to have a barbecue, and we wanted to make up a, like a flyer. And we found out that in Swahili, there was no word for free. Like, we wanted to make sure people knew that they were our guests. Um, so I don't know how we translated free, but it doesn't take long for the message to get out there as free food. But, um, <laughs> 
but what struck me, Cliff, and this, the agents in Nairobi said the same thing when the FBI agents would, you know, try to share what we had, is they came dressed in their finest clothing. They came that it was, um, they were so grateful. Um, and it's, it will stick with me forever. And, you know, the agents did all the cooking and everything. But it meant a lot to them. And I think also it, to the agents, it helped us also appreciate that it's not always us in the United States that are the victims, but other people suffer because of us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know if I answered your question. No, you did. You but certainly. That's how Actually, the people you, were. you asked a better question. That you answered a better yeah. question than I asked. But, okay. Uh, but you do that all the time, Mary. Do I really? So, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. Right. I should just let you talk. No, no, no. Um, I was trying to. You asked how the people were. They were very gracious. <laughs> um, how long were you there? I mean, how long did this investigation on the ground uh, take? Well, the investigation went from August to February. Yeah, don't, don't yeah. recall. To February. And what happened in February is another huge thing that had to happen is now because of John and the squad and the, the, the um, leads that were coming together, a lot of people have been identified. So now it moves to how do we get agents? Can we find those people and can we interview them? Um, and there was, um, I remember an agent a female agent who um, went in to interview one of these folks. And any time anyone tells you that a female FBI agent cannot get a confession from Al-Qaeda or terrorist, the answer is they can. Um, and 14 pages later and a couple hours later, um, it was on the plane coming back as we were bringing people back to the, to the Southern District. So it was till February because there became a, a decision was being made that we we're going to do a prosecution. Right, that, and this is something that can be a discussion for a whole nother session, but the way the US was working Al Qaeda at that point was through the tool of a prosecution. Mm -hmm. Whether there should have been a military um, uh, intervention, you know, was President Clinton did try, <clears throat> or he did, um, his administration did send a missile over um, to a building in uh, Nairobi, in Kenya. In, in Sudan, right? Sorry? In Sudan. Oh, in Sudan. I'm sorry. What did I say? OK. Uh, in Sudan. And, um, and so you had this decision made, we're going to have a prosecution, which means there are people, as John said, that are going to be brought to the United States. And then the witnesses that we have to bring from Nairobi and Kenya, uh, Nairobi and um, uh, Tanzania to the United States was another whole challenge for the FBI because for them to come to the United States and even understand what a court proceeding was. Um, so at that, so it was um, about five or six months on the ground. And then everything that we had, all the evidence and everything had to be um, packed up, chain of custody. We had a fly in the back of the C-130 with it, brought back to the United States as agents are still being deployed around the world to interview mm -hmm. people. John, um, the pieces are filling out. You already know a lot about Al Qaeda, but the network is becoming more clear to you through these um, through these uh, investigations and the outcome of, of the bombings and, uh, of the embassies. Um, what are you moving on? Are you getting more people under arrest? Are you expanding the network of people who are suspect in some way? Are you getting a bigger picture of what Al Qaeda is and how it's organized? Yeah, all, all of the above. Um... Uh, immediately afterwards, a few individuals in London were identified that were involved with a communication that immediately preceded the bombing. Um, they were picked up and charged, and I'll get to them again later on maybe. Uh, but all around the world, uh, countries on basically every continent, whether you had somebody walking in to an embassy that wanted to give information and had to be heard out, sometimes good, sometimes not, uh, individuals being arrested and things being recovered and identified as um, computers that are associated with Al Qaeda uh, were being found. And those did all present um, tremendous logistics for the trial. Um, computers being seized present a lot of logistics as it is, especially go back to 1998, 99, and things like that as far as uh, memorializing what's on the computer and trying to extract it. Uh, and then there was how was the computer initially recovered 
one of the issues that we ran into a lot of times was that intelligence agencies around the world were the ones first coming upon valuable information or individuals that were associated with Al Qaeda and their network. Now they were uh, the CIAs of these other countries and they want to protect their holdings, their identities and, and what's going on. So you're just not going to take somebody and bring them into custody or there's not a chain of custody as Mary describes when an FBI agent is on the ground doing some work and recovers a piece of property, we have something called a chain of custody. I take it into custody, I sign it over. If I give it to Mary, she accepts custody and signs it over. When you're dealing with intelligence agencies from other countries that are getting written material, computers, vehicles, even individuals, confessions, information, uh, there's a lot of steps involved in trying to take that and bring it into the United States and utilize it let alone then utilize it for a trial, which a lot of the information did get utilized. There are proceedings, they're called SEPA proceedings, that are utilized to get clearance with the coordination of the foreign governments to utilize certain information in a trial. And that was done um, in this trial. And you have the laptop here at the museum. We do have the laptop right. at the museum, which was the plot of Ramzi Yusuf and yeah. Khalid Sheikh Mohammed courtesy of the FBI loan for, to the museum. But, you know, let's, and I, I, I realized there was a trial and I think I counted eight people who were convicted on, and serving most of them life sentences. There's one with a 25 year sentence, but I, I, I wanna look at sort of the next phase of this because the prosecution, once you've got them in custody, you're obviously falling on leads, but then the justice system takes over and whatever your responsibilities are, it's no longer, really the primary one, the, the prosecutors take this over. But now you're looking ahead. Now you're thinking they did this and we, we know much more about them. They are much more capable than we may have thought before. They've already blown up two of our embassies. So what's the mood now within the New York office, within the work that you're doing? Because I can only imagine that you're beginning to think, when is the next shoe going to drop? John? Yes, yeah, no, th there's some very good aggressive operations that are going on there with, uh, whether it's dealing with satellite phones and uh, again, setting up stations in other countries to listen in on potential targeted conversations and things like that. Uh, we had another operation on a uh, rather remote island, uh, very far away, where we set up a listening post. And again, some of this was done with coordination with host countries some of it was done very jointly with the CIA who has primacy overseas. Uh, and we basically had listening posts set up in some of our operations, again, um, to try to continue to gain intelligence on that. So there was work going on all around the world. Uh, we had a number of individuals, again, going back to people that walk into the embassies and want to share information that always wound up um, having, you know, requiring an agent to travel out to the location to do a debriefing and, uh, assess the information that was being provided. So um, no doubt it was ramped up quite a bit post the embassy uh, between the information that came from the result of the bombings and that investigation, as well as the work that had been going on and that had been expanded upon. So a lot of uh, aggressive operations, whether it was through telephones, subsequently even with the emails. By the late 1990s, uh, you know, how much email was being utilized, some, uh, operations with European countries uh, to capture emails and, and kind of listen to those, not listen to them, uh, assess them, read yeah. them. Yeah. Mary, um, just a couple of years later, the coal attack happens just a little over two years after that, right. less than a year before 9-11. Mm -hmm. um, and you are, I don't want to skip too far ahead, but you know, you'd been to Tanzania, you'd worked the ground, and then you're sent over on this other attack, and you are running that investigation there. Uh, this is an attack on an American military uh, ship. This is an attack on our sailors, and I believe 17 are killed. Did this seem like a further ratcheting up, a more bold and daring attack? I mean, now you have a different level of responsibility and you have not necessarily as cooperative a government as was the case uh, in the African embassy bombings. Uh, take us a little bit forward into the next chapter, of course, of what would culminate less than a year later in New York. 
I think, Cliff, I think it's very public that the New York office of the FBI, and in particular John O'Neill, who was the special agent in charge at the time over the JTTF, we were aggressive is the right word, and the Southern District of New York and Eastern District of New York, very aggressive with Washington about this threat of Al Qaeda. It was not agreed upon by everyone. So it was, you have the New York office ratcheting up everything. You have the New York office saying there's going to be another attack, um, which we did believe was gonna happen overseas to a US interest. And what John is alluding to with all of the different investigation is trying to find out details of what it could be. Um, so you had that going on in the background. When the USS Cole was hit, there were, it, with the FBI agents and the prosecutors and everyone, it was a, a military act. And we assumed there was going to be a military response and that a prosecution of the USS Cole would be secondary. And so we thought our key job would be to get intelligence information to get. Um, that was not the case. And so as agents went over to work the USS Cole, it was, you know, again, it was going to end up in a prosecution, which um, eventually some did, but 9-11 would happen. So it's, it's again the US saying we're gonna prosecute these individuals, which doesn't seem like much of a deterrent to them, right? Mm -hmm. So you have it ratcheting up, you have more and more information coming in, and let's not forget that between the um, em uh, embassy bombings and the USS Cole, you have the attempt on the, the, attempt on the USS Sullivan's. Um, so there were the, the, the twin ships that Al-Qaeda um, was going to attack and it didn't happen for a number of reasons. So yes, it was definitely ratcheted up. Um, I will mention that um, if I can answer a question that you didn't ask. As you, as you do very well, yes. Um, I will mention that as the FBI is learning, and the CIA and the NSA about Al-Qaeda, they are learning about us. And a really important thing about the embassy tr trial was Al-Qaeda followed it. And in the embassy trial, we found the bombers because of phone records. So as you see the USS Cole, they had more operational security in, in a way of keeping people separate that were part of the plan. When you get to 9-11, they um, did not make one phone call that we know of um, from a phone or a cell phone without using a prepaid calling card because they learned from the embassy bombings that that's how the FBI identifies people. So we're learning, they're learning, and the world of its, uh, the threat is really, really ratcheting up. And there were different groups in Washington that believed it and groups that didn't. You know, I wanna take a moment because uh, unfortunately, uh, Natasha Mugus, who yes. runs the um, August 7th Memorial Trust in um, Nairobi could not join us for technical reasons. Uh, we had her on the line and we just couldn't close the connection. But I wanna show a photo of it because um, it is a memorial park there. There is one in Tanzania as well. Um, and uh, it really is right in the center of the city. And Natasha was here, we met her several years ago. This is pre-COVID. Uh, she was with a group of Kenyans who were coming over to testify in federal court on issues related to the attack. And um, I will say uh, she's a remarkable person, but um, speaking to her, it felt very much like I was speaking to someone who was involved in our project here, uh, memorializing 9-11. Exactly the same concerns, exactly the same focus on the families and making the memory of who was lost something that's a permanent part of the horizon in Kenya and in Tanzania as well. And, you know, Kenya has, unfortunately, been the site of repeated attacks. Mm -hmm. It's adjoining Somalia, where there has been an awful lot of Al-Qaeda-related activity. It has, unfortunately, carried over into Kenya. I just want to mention, uh, September 2013, the Westgate Mall, Al-Shabaab gunman, killing 67 people. Another Al-Shabaab attack, April 2015, University in Garissa, 148 people killed. And uh, January 2019, a hotel complex in Nairobi, 21 people killed. So um, I wonder if certainly now the Kenyans are caught up in this and they are not spared any of the consequences of this kind of terrorism. Um, I, I hate to say it, but the embassy bombing in Nairobi was kind of 
the entry into this world for them. And uh, I just wonder, they have become partners of ours in a variety of ways, you know, how the sort of twists and turns of the relationships and what you're facing together, how that kind of shapes what goes forward. And so whether it's in uh, Tanzania or in Kenya, elsewhere in Africa, I mean, we have allies who were sort of not just allies in our fight, but allies in a common fight. And, you know, John, uh, this is something, you know, when you're reaching out from New York into all of these other places that have connections, whether they're part of an investigation or they've suffered an attack like this, you know, this is common cause, is it not? Uh, very much a common cause. Uh, you know, the, 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 t the target isn't just only, only the United States. It's sometimes Western. It's viewed as Western. It's, it's viewed as many things. And sometimes the, the, the attacks are so indiscriminate. Yeah, like you said, more local individuals were killed in the embassy bombings than United States personnel. And, and here you're targeting the United States, and yet you're killing a lot of other innocent civilians. Religions, no... no uh, no prejudice towards religion either. So the attacks don't make sense in that way. The cooperation a lot of times around the world, um, again, aside from sensitivities with intelligence agencies and sometimes with what they can, can or cannot share, a lot of times it's very good. Other countries, you know, when, when Mary describes a relationship in Kenya and the cooperation in Tanzania, the cooperation there, I think about what went on in Yemen also, and Mary alluded to that. It's a, a different beast altogether. Um, the country itself is politically torn by what they want to be viewed as, as far as cooperating with the United States, being perceived as a puppet of the United States. Um, there's people in power in some of these countries also that have relatives and associates that are behind some of these terrorist actions and things like that there. So they have a stake in that regard. Mm -hmm. So the cooperation that we received in Yemen was a much different, much different I, you know, thing than what we saw. And we weren't brought in to investigations as full partners and things like that. And it was a very difficult um, environment. The safety issue was also something of, of high concern. I remember when the attack first happened, um, I was over there and I received a phone call from New York. And in the wake of the embassy bombings in which the FBI and other investigative agencies were able to get on the ground and help and work as partners with the local authorities, with the local intelligence agencies. I get a phone call about um, possibly cordoning off the harbor in which the attack took place in Yemen so that a search could be done. During the TWA investigation, which is the airline that went down back in 1976, TWA-800, uh, the sea floor off the coast of uh, Mauritius Bay, Suffolk County was scoured and the entire plane was recovered and put back together. And there was a thought on a phone call that that was going to take place in the Yemen harbor. And though I had only been there a few hours, when you took a quick look at the infrastructure and what was around, um, that was not going to happen. And certainly the cooperation, the level of cooperation was not going to happen either to allow something like that to take place. So um, it's been good to answer, get back to answering your question. A lot of countries, everybody's on board. Terrorism is a common, a common threat to everybody. Uh, any country, any nation, they experience it in all different ways. As you're saying, Kenya continues to go through it. Many countries in Nigeria, Catholic, Muslim, Jewish, wh whatever, it's all over. So cooperation often is, is good, but there are, there are things that sometimes stop it. Sensitivities, uh, politics, um, again, intelligence agencies and, and what they can and cannot share. I don't know if I answered the Absolutely. question uh, Absolutely. without getting off on a detour right. myself there. Absolutely. Absolutely. So uh, we'll turn to some questions from the audience in a moment. But, you know, we're looking at the embassy bombings. We're looking at the coal bombing. And then we're looking at 9-11. As you think of that, obviously, it's done by the same folks for the same reasons. But do you think of this as a trajectory where the capacities are, in, are increasing over time? Or are these sort of the same kinds of operations? They must have learned from things, to, from thing to thing, and, and gotten better at it. I hate to put it in those terms, but you know, describe to us the trajectory of threat if you take these incidents into account. And then, of course, there were other attacks subsequent to this. Well, they absolutely learned, and I think one of the difficult things for today's FBI is, of course, the lone wolf. 
the individual who gets radicalized online, which John and I didn't have to deal with, um, but the agents of today's JTTF have to. Um, and so it's much easier to do an attack if you're a lone wolf and you don't share that information. So with all of the protections and privileges of privacy we have in the United States, which we should, and I don't think those should be changed, you know, you now have the threat is definitely still there. I don't know if the average American remembers that. I think New Yorkers do. But um, you know, the never forget is so important because they have not forgotten. And we know from their history, the Al Qaeda's history, ISIS history, that they will wait a very long time. Um, and now you have the situation from a geopolitical uh, point of view, which in Afghanistan, where we've pulled out, you have the group that supported Al Qaeda in charge. Um, and so, in my opinion, I don't speak for the FBI, um, but that that threat has not only increased, but it's made it so much more difficult for not only our agents and our intelligence agencies, um, but around the world because they have learned, right? Why did it take 10 years to find bin Laden? Because he's off the grid. So they have learned about the technical um, uh, devices that we have, or they have learned about not using phones or whatever it may be, Cliff. But so you have those both things going on and, and you have such um, hatred for the U.S. and parts of the world that continues to be flamed. Um, and I certainly will never forget, but I really think we all need to um, seriously consider that threat and consider the great job that the United States does, the FBI, the NYPD. Some of the attacks that you mentioned in Africa occur because they can't get here. Mm. And keeping up that level of vigilance every day, 24 hours a day, is an extremely difficult task. Indeed. Let's see if we have a question or two from the audience. Uh, I would ask you to just raise your hand. Here come the lights. There's a gentleman here, Tom. Wait for the microphone, please. There you go. Thank you very much. Um, I'm just not familiar. What What are the three eyes uh, as far as oh, the intelligence? The five eyes. Uh, the five eyes. And, yep. and would you say that the cooperation between them and the FBI and, and other, is it is it at a level that it should be or, sh or should there be more? Great question. And I apologize. I usually, when I say an acronym, I describe it. But the five eyes are um, the United States, Canada, the UK, Australia, and New Zealand. New Zealand. And there is, it is much easier to share information with those five countries because of lots of agreements that have been made. Um, it does not mean that other countries like Germany or France or Spain don't share, they do. Um, what, if anything, what 9-11 did is it drastically increased the cooperation in the United, in, with the United States. However, you still have major nation states you know, superpowers, if you want to call them that, of China, Russia, Iran, um, North Korea, that we're not going to get any cooperation there, right? So um, it's all of those other countries working together. And um, the information sharing, I believe, is where it should be. It will never be perfect. Um, and the reason it will never be perfect is because of the very things that give us our American civil liberties, right? In other countries, the, the government owns your phone, the government owns your emails, um, we're making it much easier for them to, to know what's going on in their country. So now you know what the five eyes are. Yeah, thanks for asking. Do you want to add something, John? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, please. Thank you both. Um, I'd like to ask John to tell us a little more about the individuals who came to embassies to share information. What, what was their motivation? Uh, different motivations. Everything from somebody trying to do the right thing and walk in that they know somebody, to individuals that had previous relationships, may have had some criminal activity in their background, and then want to walk in and now try to be proactive and give that information in hopes that they're getting ahead of maybe getting tracked down. So arranged from that, um, despite what, what that motivation is, we go there, we listen to them, and we, we had dealings with all of those. We, we have individuals that were strictly cooperative in nature, wanted to help out, saw what was going on. Um, 
Sometimes they get relocated, families get relocated, brought back to the United States, uh, depending on the, the situation. We had a lot of that that we had to do um, during the trial with cooperators. Other times, go out and speak to somebody, identify who they are, and explain to them that they have to take a plea, possibly, and from the justice, right, to, to plead guilty to a crime so that we can continue to utilize their cooperation. And we had individuals like that, which becomes a very complicated um, issue. Uh, you may have an individual showing up in country A to want to discuss something about uh, something that occurred over in maybe Kenya and Tanzania. So they have a stake in it. We go over there and they may be a citizen of a different country. So now you speak to them and you want to, a lot of times, get confessions from them and get plea agreements before they are allowed to come into the country and give additional information. So the motivation varies, uh, as it always does. Every, and then you have people coming in for money. They, that I, how can I leave that out? Um, I, was, I was waiting for that one. I was like, absolutely. Money, yeah, I mean, sometimes rewards. people, they don't care what the cause is, what the crime is, what the ideology is. If you give me enough money, I'll give you the information on these individuals. Um, so there's, there's a lot to listen to often with that and assess. Please. Yeah, I kind of forgot money. I, that's okay. <laughs> I have your back. It, it strikes me uh, with the advantage of 100% hindsight <clears throat> that terrorists really know nothing about economics or how any systems seem to work. Uh, ironically, I mean, for example, had those planes gone into the George Washington Bridge instead of the World Trade Center we would have had New England and New York out of commission for months, if not years, until that bridge was repaired. There are similar places with such infrastructure. Uh, given, I realize that neither of you is there any longer, but is this the kind of question that comes up sometimes in terms of trying to plan uh, for what's going to happen next, that maybe at one point these terrorists will get wise to such infrastructure questions? Uh, targeting is, is this a, a, a real consideration that has to yep. be done, dealt they're, with. They're, 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 um, they're wise already, and they're very successful, unfortunately. Uh, there were plans to blow up something like the Lincoln Tunnel to, to hit infrastructure parts. Um, and yes, that's been thought about even pre-9-11, even pre-embassy bombing. I think, I think really after the World Trade Center probably gave us that kick in the behind. Um, you know, there was always things we have what's called special events planning. So going back many, many years, and, and you see how things change. You go back to 1986 when the Statue of Liberty was, um, or lip sale operation, I forget which one it was, but you know the planning that went on and the detail and the level of the planning and how that changed by the time we got to the millennium in 1999 where we're looking at manhole covers and access to buildings and um, all types of infrastructure uh, protection that takes place. So. It is thought about, and um, people try to really think, I don't like to use the term, you know, out of the box, but given how crazy some of the attacks have been and given the levels that the terrorists will go to commit an action, you really have to try to think what can be done. So I, I think, hopefully, I think we're ahead of you with that thought, that those, those infrastructures are being protected. Um, and, but it is a free country. I mean, there's, there's vulnerabilities no matter what, but Trucks don't go through the tunnels anymore because of what happened many years ago. Uh, you know, for that fact that a truck laden with C4 could blow up and possibly rupture uh, things. So, uh. yes, right. So uh, there are there are um, exercises, red cells, targeting packages, where the FBI and the CIA will think of those things, um, and uh, the NYPD does it. You know, so how do you fortify different targets? Um, John's right, the United States is a very, very vast, you know, country where 90% of our grid is out in the open, right? It's not um, just a cyber attack, but you could just attack the, the substation. So there's a lot of those things. But what we have to remember and what we knew about Al-Qaeda is they did see the World Trade Center as the center of, of um, the economy, the financial center and for, for the United States. That's what they saw. Um, they saw the, you know, capital as the center of the government, right, and the Pentagon military. So to them, the symbolism and the body count, I hate to say that as we were talking about in Nairobi, regardless of who the bodies are, 
are, you know, the two driving forces. And, and think of what those attacks did as far as crippling and changing an economy. Look at the security. Getting on a plane is much different in two days and, and travel and things like that. So there was a tremendous cost, the human cost and things like that, the physical buildings. But there's a tremendous cost that our, our economy, I think, has taken on also as a result of those attacks. And there are people here from the Bureau, I believe, and if they want to interject in anything current, feel free to also, um, <laughs> as far as what's going, because I don't want to comment on, I've been out nine years myself, so uh, things are constantly changing, and uh, if there's something to, to be said, go ahead and say it, but they've been successful, okay. in my eyes, right. both in life and, 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 right. and, and lifestyle. So, you know, one of the remarkable things about this job, from my point of view, is, is being able to meet people like this and, you know, for them being willing to talk openly about problem solving. We talked about this before and, you know, whether it's in this case or many others, which are folks who come to talk to the museum and because we are who we are and what we are, I mean, you really get an inside look at what the thinking is, what the thought process is and how these remarkable people uh, take on these incredible challenges. And I know you guys are out of it now. I know your colleagues are worthy successors to what you're doing. And they are. Um, it's they're better. They're, they're much smarter than John and I ever were. <laughs> I'm going to put I'm going to reserve Thanks, that for <laughs> well, they're <laughs> sitting you're right. right here. I right. know you're <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. we'll do a future program about right. that. But, you know, I really want to I really do want to thank you both because, you know, your, your ability to explain what this is all about and how it works, I think, is really important for the rest of us. So please join me in thanking John Liguori and Mary Gallagher. Can I make one more point? One more point. Just, just one more point to that we don't forget. We've been out of the Bureau 10 years, basically, 9 and 10 years, and, it, and it's great to see that. You know, I read in the press sometimes there were people that were arrested in England back in 1998 in the wake of the bombing. Took many years to get them extradited. You talk about cooperation and politics, not in a negative sense of politics, but politics in the sense of every country has their rules and regulations as to how they handle their citizens. But it took until 2012 until they were extradited, two of those individuals, and they were put on trial and prosecuted. And uh, kudos to not forgetting in that respect. Um, and they're spending a lot of time in jail also, both of them. Um, and they were not convicted, one and convicted, I think, in 2014 and the other in 2015. So many years later, we don't forget and, and we have to continue that up. And for those of you that are the public, that vigilance that was mentioned, uh, we shouldn't look where you're at right now. So if this doesn't remind you of things to be vigilant, uh, critical. So um, thank you again. Thank you. Sir.